Rising recession concerns, a budget move to the center, and the killing continues in Ukraine. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on what happens when you run the economy hot for the sake of employment. We do not do anybody a favor by overheating the economy, because when we overheat the economy, the chickens do come home to roost. And former IBM CEO Sam Palmisano on the opportunity for the United States to form a new coalition to compete with China in tech. I call it the Super Bowl of geopolitics. The U.S. needs to leverage the world. It was a week of anticipating what didn't happen, at least not yet, with encouraging reports on possible progress in talks between Ukraine and Russia giving way to skepticism and disappointment. We can say that the signals we hear from the talks are positive, but these signals can't silence the explosions of Russian shells. We'll see. I don't read anything into it until I see what their actions are. The Kremlin very much downplaying now the outcome of peace talks in Istanbul. A spokesman for the Kremlin saying that there has been no breakthrough, even though Russia pledged to scale back some military operations in Ukraine. It was a week when the Biden administration gave us a proposed budget that anticipated reducing the deficit, but not the debt. It's a laundry list. It's what we believe in. It's almost a campaign speech, if you think of it that way, knowing the White House knows all too well that this will be uh, twisted into a lot of different uh, pretzel pieces before this ever becomes a law. This budget has a plan to borrow a $14.4 trillion in deficits over the budget window, which is 10 years. And it was a week when former New York Fed Chair Bill Dudley warned about the danger of a recession. Every time the unemployment rate goes up by more than a half a percentage point, the next stop is a full-blown recession. And pros like Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo kept an eagle eye on a yield curve inversion. This times was inverted for a nanosecond or two yesterday, but we think the curve gets substantially inverted very quickly. And if you look at what the bond market's telling us in forwards, something like minus 30, minus 35 at the end of the year, those are staggering numbers. Mike Schumacher was talking about a nanosecond on Wednesday, but by Friday, we got that inversion as yields on two-year treasuries rose above that on tens after the 10-year sold off in response to the f jobs numbers coming out on Friday, which were pretty robust, numbers that took the unemployment rate down to 3.6 percent. And this came on the heels of a quarter that ended on Thursday with the biggest drop in treasury bonds in history. In the face of all this bond action, equities actually were relatively well-behaved, with the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq up a bit and the Dow down a bit. And the price of oil, which has been driven by the war in Ukraine, fell the most in two years after President Biden announced he'd be releasing a million barrels a, m a day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. To help us make sense of all of this, we welcome now Sarah Ketterer, CEO of Causeway Capital, and Lizanne Saunders, Charles Schwab, Chief Investment Strategist. Lizanne, let me start with you to make sense of all this. It was a tumultuous quarter and a pretty eventful week as well. What are we learning from all this? Well, clearly the, the inversion of the yield curve, which a couple of days ago, it happened briefly intraday and didn't close at that level, has, I think, garnered most of the attention, certainly a lot of the financial media attention and, and lots of confusion about what it actually says about the risk of recession. I, I think anytime you have an inversion, anytime you've got a Fed moving from extremely easy policy to tighter policy, you need to dust off the, the checklist for a recession. But to see the market uh, behave somewhat resiliency is actually not um, out of the ordinary. Uh, yield curve inversions have historically generally seen rising equity markets. It's really not until the point where recession seems like a higher likelihood you run into trouble. But I think we're in a relief rally relative to the correction that preceded it. I, I wouldn't bank on it uh, continuing uh, with, without another uh, bit of a pullback. Sarah, do you believe the relief rally? Is it here to stay? It all depends, David, on what real interest rates do. So it's very important to note that as inflation is rising, we are seeing, and this is particularly acutely an issue in Europe and in the US, real interest rates are going more negative and that creates more fuel for equity buying. So that's one of the reasons why we keep fully invested because we wanna make sure our clients get access to what the only place you can put money is in equity markets. 
in our view. And also note, I mean, there's plenty of bad news, but oil price shocks historically in the 70s, uh, early 90s, in, uh, in 2000, they're not always followed by weak equity markets. Those two are not correlated. So there are reasons to be optimistic in what looks like a very dark environment. So Lizanne, I wonder in, in the face of these negative real rates that we just heard about from Sarah, as well as oil shocks at the moment, there's a lot of talk about the 70s where we had overstimulus and then on top of that, the oil shocks. It really does raise the question about the inflation. Negative real rates indicate we still have our foot on the accelerator, not the brake. How far do we have to go to slow down this economy to get inflation under control? Well, you know, even even Powell has said he's uh, willing to accept a recession as a uh, as the end game associated with finally bringing down this inflation problem. Uh, I don't think we're really looking at a 70s type of environment. I think there's more differences between today and the 1970s than there are similarities. Stagflation, I think, used with a lowercase s generically, maybe is appropriate given weaker growth and high inflation. But really what that represented in the 70s was a high and rising unemployment rate, which is clearly different than the current environment. In addition, we have much stronger productivity now. Demographics are different, obviously unionization. So I think the type of inflation we're experiencing now is more of the countercyclical variety where inflation went from being pro-cyclical, strong demand last year helped bring on inflation, and now inflation is to such a high level that it's starting to put downward pressure on demand and growth. So maybe it's just semantics of what we call this inflation, but I don't th quite think that this is the 1970s. But, uh, but David, what we do know is that central banks have to do something about it. And that's what makes this interesting because we are moving through a real economic cycle. And, and to what degree will some of this inflation self-correct? To what degree will supply chains uh, come out of their difficulties and do so somewhat organically? I, I think that's very debatable. It's something we, in terms of investment research, we're not giving credit for that. We just assume that some of these bottlenecks are going to remain for many quarters ahead, in which case central banks have to cool demand. And that in turn is going to likely create some significant slowing of economies, which are, and all the more shores up the reasons to have great companies in your portfolio because there's some headwinds ahead. Yeah, I, I think I think there has to be a, a focus on quality right now. The, the relief rally had a bit of a low quality bias to it, but uh, I, I wouldn't bet on that uh, persisting. I, I think the focus for the stock pickers out there um, needs to have that quality wrapper around it at this point in the cycle. So, Lizanne, explain quality to me a little bit. Is that, for example, is that value versus growth? Uh, is it large cap, small cap? What do well, you look I to think for quality? You what you want to take, we think you want to take a, from a factor perspective, a hybrid between value and growth. I'm not talking about the value and growth indexes. That that really ultimately is you're making a, a sector call. I'm talking about the fundamentals of value and growth. And what tends to happen when you're in a slowing economy, you, you tend to want to look for areas that are displaying what is lacking in the economy. So as growth slows, companies that have the ability to grow their earnings tend to do better. In a rising interest rate environment, that puts downward pressure on long duration, more richly valued areas. So you wanna have that value filter. We're, we're now in an environment where there's more negative revisions to earnings than positive. So you wanna look for areas and companies that have positive earnings revisions. Again, rising interest rates, low debt to equity ratio. So I think this is an environment where you wanna be more factor focused than style box focused or even uh, sector focused. And, uh, and markets are such extraordinary discounting mechanisms. They look ahead and anticipate. And so that's why it might be a little late to be piling in more to energy and metals and mining that have had just incredible run. And we like to look where others aren't. And there are definitely segments where companies can pass on some of this cost increase, in some cases, all of it. And those are remarkable businesses to be in in an inflationary environment. And they're out there, uh, often priced at lower valuations than the overall market. Uh, Lizanne, are uh, earnings going to bail us out? Well, earnings should still be in positive territory, but we've been in a, uh, in a descending pattern since the second quarter of last year. 
Um, that was inevitable. You had almost 100% S&P earnings growth in the second quarter of last year because of the base effect relative to the year prior. That descended to about 32% in the fourth quarter. But we're now down in the mid-single digit range. Now, we may find again that analysts have set the bar too low, but we've been in a descending rate from a beat rate perspective and a lower percent by which companies are beating. And as I already mentioned, you've got that trend of now more negative earnings revisions than positive. So I think we're on the cusp of a more difficult period. I think what will be more important in this reporting season about to start is less about what was reported for the first quarter, but the combination of outlooks broadly, but specifically around uh, profit margins and the ability to maintain those profit margins in light of rising labor costs, as well as rising input costs in other areas. Sarah, what are you expecting from earnings? Mm, well, in terms of cap, market cap weighted, you obviously have to look at some of the big constituents and it's somewhat of a mixed bag. It really, some of it depends, especially for the internet stocks on what happens to advertising. Uh, a stock like Alphabet is interesting to us and obviously a, a giant in the US market because they have some of their ads, a good portion of them that are related to travel and leisure. And we see that recovering. If you've been through any airports lately, they're mobbed. And just look at the online uh, searches for travel, both domestic and international, it's, it's going crazy. So there's obviously a lot of pent up demand and it's somewhat debatable to what degree inflation will crimp that spending. And that ought to be good for some of the, uh, some of the big caps like, like Alphabet, not to mention their cloud business, et cetera. So it's, it's yeah, I, I think it's somewhat hard to say. What we can say is those companies that were achieving record profit margins are likely to see, I mean, it's hard to make generalizations, but they're going to have a little bit of a struggle. That We might have seen the peak there for some time. Yeah, it sounds like yeah, and Sarah, to your point about, you know, pent, pent up demand on the services side, one of the potential benefits to bringing inflation down as we're starting to see some pent down demand on the good side. And clearly at the core level of inflation, much of that was driven by the good side of the economy. And we are starting to see some weaker numbers in large part because whether it's wage data, consumption data, retail sales, you, you, you look at the difference between nominal and real. And unfortunately in instances like wage growth, lofty numbers in nominal terms, but still in negative territory from a real perspective. Yeah, we saw that actually on Friday, actually, where the, the, it was 5.6% up in, in wages uh, year over year. But in fact, if you take into account inflation, they also lost some money in terms of purchasing power. Lizanne Saunders and Sarah Ketterer will be staying with us as we come back and look around the corner to what's coming up, not just next week, next, next quarter, but down the road. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. One of the nice things about this environment is that with all the carnage out there, with so many of the smaller companies and the less well-capitalized companies and the less well-managed companies are starting to really have difficulty, in some cases going out of business. And I think this environment is going to afford the bigger well-managed companies the ability to pick up market share and in many cases maintain their dominance. Give us one favorite that you think still has a ways to go. I still like Microsoft, speaking of the behemoths and, mm -hmm. and AOL, although I wouldn't necessarily consider that a technology company anymore. That was our very own Lizanne Saunders appearing on Wall Street Week with Louis Ruckheiser back in 2001 when AOL was still a behemoth, by the way. Lizanne has remained with us along with Sarah Ketter of Causeway Capital. So we've had a conversation about what's happened this quarter, what's going to be coming up around the corner here. But let's look down the road. Sarah, let me start with you. Uh, where is there cause for hope? we got a lot of concerns about inflation, about the tightening we're expecting in response to that. And by the way, we still have a war going on where people are dying every day over in Ukraine. But what are some of the possible upsides for investors down the road? Maybe perhaps not too far down the road, and I hinted at that before the break, are the pandemic recovery stocks. They were certainly hit very hard in 2020 and had a, a false dawn in early 2021, and then the Omicron variant uh, gripped them again and dragged them lower. They rallied a bit, and, and they were doing very well from January of this year until February 23rd, particularly the ones in Europe. 
And then we had this, as you noted, this horrendous invasion. So that uh, really hit these stocks hard. Some of the great airline companies, like one of the best discounters in the world, Ryanair, crushed. And these are opportunities for investors because we can't assume that invasions last forever and this pandemic is thankfully dissipating. So there are um, other ones in aerospace, travel and leisure. You can find airport companies, um, aircraft engine manufacturers have only one or two competitors. Like it's a, this is where active management gets very excited, as you can tell. They, they, there are pandemic recovery stocks out there. They're in food catering and retail. They, they just need, they need the, uh, the mask to be off, the people be out again. And then, uh, and as we discussed before, not too great of an inflation headwind cutting into their discretionary spend. So Lizanne, in addition to possibly the pandemic recovery, you may agree with exactly what we just heard from Sarah, but there's one other factor I, I wonder about, and that's fiscal stimulus. Right now we have essentially a, a de-stimulus because we're coming off of so much fiscal stimulus in the United States. At the same time, that horrendous war in Ukraine that goodness knows we want to be over soon, at some point will be over, and there'll have to be the need to invest a fair amount. Could that be a potential fiscal stimulus, at least in Europe? Yeah, I, I think the the investment story longer term, not just driven by uh, the the terrible tragedy going on in Europe right now, although that clearly will stimulate some in investment, whether it's energy infrastructure, um, food infrastructure, not to mention the rebuilding of actual infrastructure in Ukraine. But even prior to that, I think what the the pandemic brought about was the necessity of investments in certain areas. And there was so much low hanging fruit of inefficiency in uh, quite a few segments of our economy, um, healthcare, education. And I think the necessity of sort of stepping up and becoming more efficient and investing in digital driven by the pandemic, I don't think kind of goes back under the rock. I, I think we have unleashed what is likely to be an era of, of stepped up investment and probably along with it, higher productivity. It doesn't prevent a possible recession in the near term, but that's where I think there is sort of a shining light when you think longer term about what may come out of the combination of both the pandemic and the war. It may even be medium term to the degree that uh, that digital spend is so necessary that it'll take precedent even when other, if there's some sort of curtailment of capital expenditures, companies have to make that transition and they need to do so globally. So we think of that as somewhat uh, non-cyclical part of the whole technology spend. Lizanne, I don't think I know many people who are rooting for a recession, although, as you suggest, a lot of people have to be prepared for the possibility of it. But is there a potential, if I can say that, upside potential to some creative destruction? I think that's what you were talking about. Whenever you have a lot of money sloshing around, some bad decisions are made. If you take some of that liquidity away, then actually people have to make some tough decisions and maybe you sort out maybe the, the sheep from the goats. Yeah, I, I think there have been some uh, maybe unintended consequences of this massive amount of liquidity, whether it's mispricing in various markets and asset bubbles. So I think there's a benefit that will accrue there. And then as we already touched on, the unfortunate possible necessity of constraining aggregate demand in order to rein in the combination of the supply chain problems and, and just the, the feeder effect it's having on, on pricing and inflation, we may need a recession to calm all of those uh, forces. And it may not have to be a particularly deep one. But I do think what we're looking at is a more kind of normal cycle. If we're heading into recession, what it looks like, the causes of it being tighter monetary policy, that's sort of traditional. The, the last cycle, the COVID recession, the aftermath of it, um, th there was no playbook for that. That was incredibly unique. I think this next cycle, both into the next recession and coming out, will be a little more, I don't want to say garden variety, but a little more in keeping with your typical recession recovery type cycle. So, Sarah, give us just a little taste of your secret sauce here as an investor, as somebody who maintains a portfolio. As you take a look, you've talked about things like coming back from pandemic. That's sort of a structural thing across yeah. the board. As you try to figure out which companies really are being run well and efficiently are making sensible decisions, what do you look at? And what are the, what are those companies? Give me an example or two. Yeah, 
Well, just to take up what Lizanne just mentioned, to the degree we've got, we're going to see a typical recovery or typical recession recovery, then let's find those stocks that tend to do well in that environment. So what doesn't do well initially as you head into the bottom of the economy, and I, I'm speaking really for everything ex-China, the rest of the world is largely on the same monetary policy cycle, meaning tightening other than China. And uh, banks, other financials, they tend to bottom somewhere as, as we get into that significant amount of tightening and the recession takes hold. And then they rally very strongly, you may remember, uh, the early part of 2009, unbelievable performance. So, so if if history is going to repeat itself, if what Lizanne says is correct, which I agree with, this is a little more normal, a little more, then, then those would be good stocks to own. And the most bombed out ones are in the part of the world that's really been hit hard, which is Europe. So European financials, and you could also go with the energy transition. One of the silver linings of this horrendous uh, energy disruption is the greater need to accelerate than move to low and then zero carbon type uh, renewable energy. And some of the European utilities are expert at this and they're trading at four or 6% okay. dividend yields. Okay, that's great to have a little bit of sucker here at the end of a pretty rough quarter. Thank you so much to Lizanne Saunders and Sarah Ketterer. When we come back, the week ahead on Global Wall Street. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now to look at the week ahead, starting with Juliet Sally in Singapore. Thanks, David. We'll be watching to see if the second phase of Shanghai's lockdown ends as planned Tuesday. Bloomberg Intelligence forecasts the lockdown in the city of almost 26 million people will have even greater ramifications for China and the world than the already significant impact from Shenzhen's lockdown. Morgan Stanley Friday cut China's 2022 economic growth forecast to 4.6% from 5.1% and Citi has warned of risks to the second quarter outlook as the nation sticks to a strict COVID-0 approach. Approach. Now over to Danny Berger in London. Danny. Thanks, Juliet. In Europe, in the coming weeks, the main story will still be Russia's invasion into Ukraine, which continues into a new month. A few key things to focus on. One will be any talks between Russia and Ukraine and any efforts to alleviate the ongoing humanitarian crisis. Secondly, any impact to European politics with both Hungarian elections and French elections coming on the horizon this week. And finally, any continued impact to both energy and inflation dynamics in Europe. Now over to Romain Bostic in New York. Thanks, Danny. A busy week ahead for economic data with monthly factory orders to be released on Monday. They are expected to show a contraction as rising input costs crimp some manufacturing activity. On Tuesday, the Institute for Supply Management releases its services PMI data, which economists say likely rebounded in March after sliding a bit in February. On Wednesday, the Federal Reserve releases minutes from its March policy meeting. Fed Chair Jerome Powell has indicated that the minutes will include details on the discussion over plans to reduce the central bank's balance sheet. The week concludes with the release on Friday of the USDA's World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. That WASDE Crops Outlook next week follows a planting report that we saw this week that pointed to the biggest acreage ever devoted to soybeans. David? Coming up, what does a post-sanctions world mean for tech competition between China and the United States? We find out from former IBM CEO Sam Palmasano. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. There's hundreds of thousands of people who are being cut off from help by Russian forces. The seeds in places like Maryville. Nick Wilden is doing. It's not stopping. It's like something out of a science fiction movie. President Biden described the death and destruction we're seeing from Russia's military invasion of Ukraine during his recent trip to Europe, 
But this war goes beyond the military. It is being fought in the markets as well, with the U.S. and its allies imposing severe sanctions on the Russian economy, something Ukrainian President Zelensky says is the only thing likely to get through to Vladimir Putin. There's no other language than efficient sanctions that Russian leadership can understand. Their war machine has to be cut off from the means of existence. And when it comes to the economic battle, it's not just the United States versus Russia. China plays a crucial role. I made it clear to him that make sure he understood the consequences of him helping Russia. But I pointed out the number of American and foreign corporations that left Russia as a consequence of their barbaric behavior. Which poses a difficult question for President Xi, who has pledged to support Mr. Putin but has to keep a careful eye on his country's role in the global economy, which Nobel laureate Michael Spence says he is surely doing. China understands something that um, President Putin doesn't seem to understand, and that is that any economy, even a big one, like China or even the United States, can't perform at anything like its full potential in isolation. And so I, I expect China to sort of move carefully and, and try to thread the needle, but to avoid uh, a scenario in which we start dividing the world up into blocks. When it comes to international economics, and particularly when it involves technology, we turn to our very special contributor. He is Sam Palmasano, former CEO of IBM. Thank you so much for being with us, Sam. So we're seeing a lot of changes in trade patterns, in economic dealings, in payment systems around the world because of the war in Ukraine. Talk to us about what specifically that may mean in the area of technology, whether it's Russia or China, depending on which way China comes down. Well, David, it's actually an excellent point. And I think that the, the sad controversy of the Ukraine is just accelerating transition or changes that I believe will potentially occur. I mean, as you know, everybody's talking about Russia, but also the implications in the U.S.-China relationships. And there's no doubt about it. And there's a lot of speculation that China and the U.S. will separate economically. Uh, I really don't think that'll occur. Um, the reason I say that is these economies are too large and too interconnected to the world. You mentioned payment systems, flow of capital, all those things these economies are dependent upon. So I don't think separation totally occurs. However, as I say that, I, there's no doubt, I believe, that when it comes to technology and future technologies, there's going to be competition between the two countries. And that's more so, I'll say, China, U.S., I mean, Russia really doesn't have the kinds of technologies that we're talking about. But if you think about things like semiconductors, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, cyber computing, clearly there's going to be competition. And therefore, I think there'll be less collaboration between China and the United States. So if that happens, because it certainly looks right now like that's where it's heading, we're not heading to a one big globe where we're all the same and we all deal with each other, maybe more separation, particularly in areas like tech. If that happens, how are we, and for we, for the moment, I'll say the United States situated, because some people are concerned that China, for example, has really been investing a lot more in tech than we have been. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I think uh, last year alone it was 1.5 trillion. We're estimates in that range. So yes, China is out investing in the United States. They're not out investing the West. So I'll comment on that a little bit. But I mean, as you think about it, it's all this U.S.-China uh, focus. I mean, I call it the Super Bowl of geopolitics. You know, it's the Titans. Uh, if you look at it today, to use a sports analogy, the U.S. is about a three-point favorite in the game going into the game. However. China is spending a lot and they're catching up and can have a heck of a fourth quarter. So my point being in that analogy, David, is the fact that the U.S. needs to leverage the world. It cannot go alone. And I believe there's great capability, what I'll say sports analogy, from an all-star team, there's great capability in Europe and Japan and Southeast Asia. So if the West could come together, i.e. as they've come together when it comes to the Ukraine, if they could come together and optimize their focus, their investments, I think they clearly could continue Continue to lead and out compete China. So, so, Sam, I want to come back to if they can come together, because that could be a big if. But let's assume that could happen. Who's on our team, so to speak, to continue your Super Bowl analogy? Who are the major players in tech on our team? I think the major players, if you go through it, I mean, there's, if you look at the, take semiconductors as an example, uh, I think it's a good example. Everybody's focused on manufacturing capacity called fabs. That's important because there's such a dependency on Taiwan and there's concerns and risk over China and the Taiwan, Taiwanese relationship. Having said all that, there's, there's different elements to the ecosystem in 
and semiconductors. There's fabric. There's the tools to fabricate. There's the design tools. There's the materials. There's packaging. And there's great expertise, especially in Europe. Europe has great research and great expertise in many of these areas. South Korea and Japan has great expertise in the manufacturing tools and manufacturing side of the house. So my point being is that if you look at the capabilities, the U.S. certainly leads today in design and packaging. There's no doubt about it, and the research capability. But you combine these capabilities between Europe, mostly Germany, uh, Japan, uh, and I say really South Korea and Singapore. But you know those countries within those regions, you can see how this thing could align. And they're they're nations that the U.S. works. Quite well with, as you well know. So, Sam, I noticed you didn't mention Taiwan, uh, and we hear a lot about Taiwan for manufacturing semiconductors, the largest chip manufacturer in the world. Are they a strength or a vulnerability given their situation with respect to China? Uh, I, my opinion, and I've said this for the past couple of years, even before the situation today with Russia, is we need to lessen the dependency. The West needs to lessen the dependency on Taiwan. After observing what happened with Hong Kong. It's, it's hard to predict where Taiwan will end up long term. And it takes a long term to build this fab capacity. You just can't do it in six to nine months. You're talking years to build this capacity up around the world. And that's beginning today. Uh, there are two uh, funding proposals. One in the United States is the 51 billion that you hear about in the Innovation Act. It was the CHIPS Act. And there's another 40 some billion euros uh, going through the system in Europe. So that would be combined. It's, it's a significant amount of money to create these fabrication facilities uh, around the world. So that over time could lessen the dependency. But I think the West, and I mean the West, Western economies have to de-risk their exposure to Taiwan. Let's come back to that critical question of if we can get together on the same team here with some of the countries that you've mentioned. There are political aspects to that in the United States domestically. There's been some resistance to that. So sort of just let's make it sure it's made in America. What are the prospects of us overcoming that so we really have an essentially a really integrated trade when it comes to tech with Europe, with South Korea, with Japan? Well, I mean, I, I believe that I understand why it's important to create jobs within the United States. Uh, and this will occur. I mean, it just it, it depends on what areas we're focused on versus our colleagues. And what do I mean by that? Obviously, when Intel makes a $20 billion investment in Ohio, that creates jobs in the United States and that fabrication capability. As we do advanced research and design, that creates jobs in the United States. There's nothing wrong with Germany creating jobs or South Korea creating jobs, in my opinion, or Japan creating jobs. If you think about this, all these companies, all these countries, I should say, based upon this is the future, not the past, will be creating jobs. And these are highly skilled jobs. So you're not going to be outsourcing manufacturing workers. I mean, if you look at a person that works in, in your average fabricator or the manufacturing capacity for a semiconductor, they tend to be a master's in electric engineering or, or PhDs in physics and things like that. The rest of the place is robots. So when we talk about these things, they're, they're capital intensive, but they're really highly, highly skilled, highly paid people. And I think the entire world will lift as we invest in, the, invest in those areas going into the future. Now, it's different. I understand discrete manufacturing, I'll call it tops and bottoms, and I can understand where politics are on both sides of the pond as we talk about that. But this isn't that. High tech is not that at all. And they really should, I think, hopefully understand the difference between high tech and let's call it standard process or standard manufacturing. Sam, one major economy we've left out of the discussion so far, and that's India. Where do they come out in technology? They more or less are really working with Russia when it comes to oil and gas. What about technology? Uh, India is very good in software, and they have very good software capabilities. Uh, so in some of these areas, I, I went through quite quickly, I didn't focus on like artificial intelligence. They have pretty good capabilities around software. They do not have the expertise around the physics or the semiconductors or the electronics. And the reason why you need a combination of the above, even for artificial intelligence, especially for quantum computing, because if you think about what a semiconductor is in the software world of artificial intelligence, it is the engine. It's, it's the engine, it's the V12, not a V4, it's a V12 that's required to power these uh, systems that are going to analyze massive amounts of data and apply it. But India is strong in software. Uh, there's been challenges, you know, historically with India, more so than some of the other countries, but I do think they could participate, but it might be a little more complicated than, let's say, South Korea or Singapore, in Asia, that is, or Japan. Okay, Sam, thank you so very much. Really appreciate it. I'm delighted to say that Sam Palmasano is a contributor to Wall Street Week. And of course, he's the former CEO of IBM. Coming up, we wrap up the week with special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're joined again this week by our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, we got jobs numbers out at the end of the week on Friday. Strong job numbers once again. Also, by the way, I should say strong increases in wages. At the same time, it does raise the question whether this economy may be even more overheated than we thought. Look, I think the single most important statistic for judging overheating is the ratio of vacancies to unemployment. And with these jolts numbers and these unemployment numbers, that statistic is going to be plumbing new highs uh, in the, in, when it's next uh, calculated. And that suggests even more tightness in labor markets. And I think that points towards uh, even more inflation. So I think near term, we've got a if anything, a bit greater inflation concern uh, than we had before we saw uh, these numbers. Of course, it's good that the economy is looking relatively strong. I think if you were in doubt as to whether the previous weakness was fundamental or was caused by Omicron, this would tend to tilt you towards thinking that it was caused uh, by Omicron. But look, uh, Labor market indicators are always contemporaneous or lagging, so we don't know what the future holds. And certainly there are worrisome signs in terms of what's happening with consumer sentiment. But for now, I would say these are uh, relatively inflationary numbers, and that's how markets look to be reading them with significant movements towards yield curve inversion. Larry, at the same time, you'd be the first to say th these jobs numbers are good for the people who are getting jobs, and particularly some of the people at the lower end of the spectrum, which is something we should be concerned about. I is there no way that we can both take care of those people, make sure they're employed, that they are getting paid fairly, and not overheat the economy? David, look, this is why uh, the earned income tax credit is such a good idea. This is why I've supported increases in uh, minimum wages. This is why we need stronger programs for people who don't go to college of uh, many kinds. But we do not do anybody a favor by overheating the economy, because when we overheat the economy, the chickens do come home to roost at some point as the inflation has to leave uh, the system. And so I think that this idea that we simply cheer on more and more employment without thinking about the inflationary consequences is like a doctor who celebrates the results of the prescription of their painkiller without thinking about what's going to come uh, down uh, the road. I think the Fed, too late, has awakened to that and is moving towards a strategy that is much more oriented uh, towards uh, tightening. Larry, let's talk about those chickens maybe coming home to roost. There is talk about a possible recession here. You and I have talked about that this at various times. I know you focused on historically one of the issues about the 4% number, under 4% unemployment at the same time you have over 4% inflation. We also had the yield curve, the twos, tens yield curve invert a couple of times this week, including after the jobs numbers came out. Uh, do you pay much attention to the yield curve at this point as a predictor of recession? I look, I look at it. I don't I pay a little less attention to it than people in the markets uh, do. And I think it's important to understand that it's not a causal relationship. If it exists, it's a canary in the coal mine kind of relationship. So it's not that changing the 10-year changing the interest rate, if you could do it in some way, will change the prospect of recession. Rather, it's that when people are forecasting that the Fed is going to be cutting rates, they're also forecasting that that's going to happen because there's a recession. So it's a correlation thing, not a causation thing. I think that the, what's happening with the yield curve adds to a sense of economic anxiety that in situations like this, historically, we have not achieved soft landings and we have seen uh, recessions. Is it a certainty that we'll see a recession in the next two to three years? No. Is it more likely than not that we will see a recession in the next two years? I don't see how anybody can look at either the historical experience or what markets are predicting and not think that it's 50-50 better than 50-50 
that a recession will start sometime within the next two years. Uh, Larry, we also got the, the budget from the White House at the beginning of the week this week, and everybody agrees it's aspirational. What is sent out as the budget from the White House does not actually become law, but it does reflect values, as person after person from the White House reminds us. What are the values that you saw in President Biden's budget? So I was glad to see increases in the defense budget. I was glad to see a substantial indicative commitment towards doing something about COVID. I was glad to see uh, an emphasis on mental health as a theme in the budget. I was glad to see open-mindedness um, and open to complete negotiation on the remnants of Build Back Better rather than re-prescribing uh, all of uh, that expenditure. Those were all, I thought, uh, positive uh, steps. I would have liked to see more realism on the tax side. I think the billionaire's uh, tax is a bad idea whose time will never come. I think it's mislabeled to give it a kind of populist uh, appeal relative to what's being proposed. I think the general idea of taxing capital gains when people don't have those capital gains and haven't sold uh, the assets is not a realistic one. I think a much better strategy would have been to concentrate on a variety of loophole issues, capital gains at death, carried interest, which the administration has still not gotten uh, done, changing like-kind exchanges uh, for uh, real estate. But the single most important thing, even if nothing else happens, is that the historic bit of economic diplomacy that Janet Yellen concluded on uh, corporate tax with other countries is enabled by the necessary U.S. legislative uh, action. Uh, Larry, if you read the fact sheet put up by the White House earlier this week, they led with fiscal responsibility, the fact that they would be reducing the deficit. At the same time, if you look at the projection over the 10 years that they do for budgets, actually, as a percentage of GDP, the debt grows from something over 102 percent to something over 106 percent. Is that sustainable for the United States? It's worse than that, uh, David, because the interest rate forecasts in the president's budget look comical today in light of what's happened uh, to interest rates. That's fair enough. They lock in those budget forecasts months in advance. But my guess is that if you used realistic forecasts, you'd add another 5 percent uh, to the debt to GDP ratio. I suspect, given what's happening to interest rates, that there's going to be a need for more fiscal adjustment than uh, the administration imagines. I suspect the administration has underestimated the national security expenditures that will be necessary going forward. And I think we're moving towards a moment when we're going to have to start thinking about fiscal policy as well as monetary policy as an anti-inflationary uh, tool. So I think this is a beginning for budget discussions, not an end of uh, budget discussions. Well, it does strike me, Larry, you spent so much time in Washington. I haven't heard, I don't think, any politician draw that connection between taxes on the one hand and inflation on the other. Everybody's against taxes, everybody's against inflation, but I haven't heard anybody getting us ready for the, th the fact that if you really don't like inflation, you may have to put up with more taxes. You may have to put up with more taxes or you may have to put up with uh, some, uh, some well-designed uh, Expendi uh, expenditure cuts. I don't think we're quite there at that point, but I think if we ha start having difficulty containing inflation, which I think is quite possible, or we find unacceptable or the global economy finds unacceptable the magnitude of the interest rate increases that are necessary to contain inflation, then I think the whole issue of fiscal restraint may get back on uh, the uh, on the play on uh, on the playing field. I don't think that's an issue for the next several months, but I think if one's thinking about where we're looking down the road, that's something we have to consider.
You're absolutely right, Larry. I left out the possibility of cutting spending because it's just been so long since I've really seen that happen in Washington. Thank you so much to our very special contributor to Wall Street Week. He's Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, it's no April Fool's joke when big banks screw up big time. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Learning from our mistakes, or maybe not. All of us can make mistakes, and sometimes when we go back over them, we cannot believe what we were thinking, or maybe what we were not thinking. And the big banks certainly are no exception to this rule. There's the London big whale fiasco at JP Morgan that led to the end of senior executive Ina Drew's 30-year career. I accepted responsibility for the events that happened on my watch in one of the portfolios in my division. And there's Deutsche Bank in 2018 mistakenly transferring $35 billion to Eurex Clearing, which was more than the total net worth of the bank at the time. Germany's biggest lender has sent about $35 billion to an exchange as part of its dealings. They already have problems with risk management. <laughs> this is not a headline. A flub, you want a to flub read. is a polite way of putting it. Yeah, $35 billion just sort of walked out the door. To Citi, in the height of the pandemic, paying over $500 million to Revlon creditors despite a fight over the funds, money that it could not get back. Citigroup it unexpectedly lost its legal battle to recover half a billion dollars it mistakenly sent to Revlon lenders. It's the latest blow to the bank that's been forced to answer to regulators and tighten its internal controls. Mind you, this all comes after Congress decided to make sure those banks were paying attention, giving us all the protections of a law called Dodd-Frank. Because of this law, the American people will never again be asked to foot the bill for Wall Street's mistakes. So it must have been particularly painful to Barclays this week when it found out that it had a teensy-weensy clerical error in selling more in structured notes than the SEC had given it permission to sell. You see, it had asked for and received the okay to sell $20.8 billion worth of these securities. But apparently someone wasn't paying attention and kept selling them way past the point they were supposed to stop, like to the tune of $36 billion leaving Barclays with an estimated loss of $591 million. I just think it's just a simple filing error. They, they forgot to add an extension to the shelf. Or, and, and that's very embarrassing, um, you know, logistical error. The financial hit is bad, but, you know, fairly manageable. Uh, it's more the reputational hit. It may be April Fool's, but this one is no joke. Certainly not for Barclays management. Let's see what we can learn from this one. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.